Hi everybody. So tonight we're talking about perimenopause. Uh, people have lots of questions about perimenopause. First of all, is there such a thing as perimenopause? Um, we get asked this a lot. Um, and I'm going to be joined by Jackie. Jackie is a nurse practitioner. She's an assistant medical director at Mays, and um, she's actually a menopause expert, which also makes her um, a perimenopause expert. And I just want to make sure, hi, Kat. Oh my God, it's so great to see you. Um, can you wave at me? I don't, it's like so frustrating when I can't wave. Anyway, I got to get Kat on here live. Um, so I see Helen, I see Kat. Does anybody else remember Romper Room where at the end she would say, I see John and I see Kelly and I see Amanda, um, but I'm not seeing, I am not seeing, oh, Kat said hi, but I am not seeing Jackie. Jackie, where are you? I'm really, oh, people are sending hearts. Um, okay, Jackie, we really need John here because uh, I can talk about menopause, but not as much. Oh, Jackie just joined. I'm just going to invite you to come in, Jackie. Um, there we go. Jackie. I cannot do the hormonal parts of this. Oh, we're getting all these hearts, Jackie. Hopefully you're here. To ah, there you are. Hi, I was like, you need to save me because I can talk about perimenopause, but I cannot talk about the hormonal piece of it quite so well. So how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. I was just giving all your menopause creds. Like you had, you're like, um, no, you're not that you're, you're actually not menopausal, but you have um, certification, right? And I forgot the name of the association, so you should. Yeah. Sure. So I'm, I'm all, I'm all, I studied up for the test and I signed up for it, but then with COVID, I couldn't take it. So I'm not actually certified, but I did all the work. But you know phone. everything about, yeah, NAMS in the North American Menopause Society. And so one of the things we often see in our practice is women who are menopausal because that obviously affects their sex life. So um, if you're menopausal or if you're not yet menopausal, so let's let's jump in. Can we talk about perimenopause without talking about menopause, Jackie, or no? Not really. I mean, <laughs> it all starts with, you know, that final period, and that's the definition of menopause. But menopause was so the end of the reproductive years, but menopause can only be sort of defined the day of menopause in retrospect, meaning that you'll have to have gone 12 full months without your period coming in order to say, look backwards and say, okay, this was my last period. And it plays funny games because sometimes you're like 11 months in and then the clock restarts. So it's right. a cool women joke. find that really frustrating. I mean, women really, really find that frustrating, right? So Me too. yeah, an average average menopause is 52. 51. 51. Mm -hmm. I mean, give or take, we get 51 ish. Um, and then that you know, means that it's okay if you're 49 and it's okay if you're 55, right? Like Absolutely. that's average. Most of us aren't average, right? Okay. Very much an average number. Um, some women go into it later, you know, as early as their late 50s, late as their late 50s. And some women, you know, soon now as as 40 or even late 30s in some other cases, we're seeing more of that. So really- Do you have any idea why we're seeing this early menopause? I think there's a lot of, you know, um, hormone disruptors that, you know, are affecting women and other, you know, other kind of more systemic health issues that cause sort of a premature ovarian, we call it a premature ovarian failure, where the ovaries just, you know, have decided it's their time. Um, and unfortunately, we are seeing that at a younger age, the same way that we're seeing girls get their periods at a younger age now. Um, I thought that was mostly due to better nutrition. Is that not well, it's about, it's about obesity, right? I mean, the more body fat you put on, especially early on, the body fat makes estrogen. So women, you know, kids who are younger can, can you know, see that same. But it, that has to do with hormone disruptors and, and food and, you know, and, and all that kind of thing. So unfortunately, we're seeing it at both ends of the, but you know. The moms, if your moms who are listening to this, this does not mean if your daughter got a period early, you should start putting on a diet, right? Are we no, oh my gosh, not at all. Nope, nope. Okay. Just, I think just healthy eating, you know, like. That's a whole topic for a different day, for sure. Great. So we'll yeah. pass that on. Okay, <laughs> yeah. good. I just I need to clarify that because you know I know mothers go, oh my god, my daughter got a period. It must be obesity. She's not. No, okay. not, yeah. at all. Not, not at all. Not a good. Not a good thing. Our hormones okay. are finicky, you know, and I think perimenopause is, it speaks to that really. I mean, perimenopause is the peri, just means the time around menopause. And that's super kind of a vague term, but it really just means the time leading up to menopause when you might start to notice some 
sort of symptomatic changes. And that can really be, you know, 10 or sometimes even more years prior to that final period. So this can sort of plague women, you know, for many years. And people really sometimes misdiagnose it in the beginning as other things. It kind of, you know, isn't always um, recognized well by clinicians. So it's well, important to go, yeah, to a clinic. Yeah, no, no, I, I'm so glad you made that point because I think so often people haven't heard of perimenopause. I think that was part of the reason I thought it was really important to talk about it. Like sure. people are like, what? Like what's perimenopause? And if you don't know it, it's so easy to exactly what you said, mm -hmm. end up diagnosing it as something else. Correct. So first, I guess let's talk about what it is and then maybe some of the things it gets diagnosed as. So let's talk about what it is what it is. I know that's complicated, but it is, it's sort of, it's very nuanced. It's very complicated, which is why it takes really like a skilled clinician to work through um, the phase of perimenopause through menopause with the patient. So it can present, you know, early perimenopause, you know, so let's say we're taking the average woman, right? So 50, 51 year old woman, and we're looking back at her decade of life prior to that time. Um, and maybe in her early 40s, you know, she starts to notice that her periods are getting a little bit closer together, um, meaning maybe she gets them every 24 days instead of every 27 like she used to. Or maybe her periods are a little bit heavier than she's used to having them. Maybe she's getting more PMS. Maybe she's feeling a little more moody in general. Um, those are all sort of the skipping. subtle kind of things. Also that... skipping periods, right? Every once in a while, the period doesn't show up and you think you're pregnant. Oh, my God. Right. Well, skipping periods tends to happen later in perimenopause. Oh, so that interesting. Happens, yeah. And usually in the beginning, they're I mean, this are the exceptions to every rule, but the typical presentation is early on and they sort of get closer together. And as we move towards that, you know, later perimenopausal phase, the periods, you sometimes get lighter and spaced further apart or heavier. But really, the, the spacing happens sort of when those ovaries are doing their last ditch efforts to stay to, to stay ovulating. So yeah, for the women who are watching, the, the Jewish Orthodox women who are watching, I know getting the period more, more like closer together can completely be disruptive of your life. So um, that's really an issue and something you can... We'll, I mean, we'll talk about like, what, what do you do about this? So, so one thing that people see is the period getting mm -hmm. wonky, right? And then as we move sort of through, we'll start to see, you know, some what we call vasomotor symptoms, which are hot flashes and night sweats. Um, and those are, you know, fluctuating due to, as we think, we don't really know sort of the physiology of why that's even happening in women, but we, we suspect it has to do with fluctuating levels of hormones and our body's internal thermostat, which is our pituitary gland, which speaks to our ovaries actually, um, sort of being confused by the fluctuating hormones and not knowing what to do with it. So if you think of your pituitary as a thermostat, it really just responds to like trying to keep homeostasis and keep an equilibrium, but it can't because your, your body's constantly changing on it. And, and those, those ups and downs cause these, what we call vasomotor symptoms. And that can be really disruptive. I mean, it makes it so, you know, women are having trouble sleeping because they're waking up with night sweats or they'll be in the middle of a meeting and get a hot flush when they, you know, least want one. And so um, those are usually some of the most common complaints we hear in the perimenopausal period. Hey, I'm and, just yeah. laughing because somebody, you know, wrote in about that. And then, okay, yes, I know. I think that is very disruptive. The period's getting messed up, yeah. the hot flashes. What about like memory loss or sort of feeling like that brain fog? Brain fog's a real, the real deal. A brain fog, I mean, your brain has many, many estrogen receptors. And so as estrogen declines, which is what happens in perimenopause, your estrogen and, and progesterone are, you know, sort of precipitously going down. Progesterone usually a little bit first. Um, and we, the brain responds to that by, you know, sort of like things that you would normally be quick to, you know, to speak of that come to your mind easily. All of a sudden you can't find the words. Um, it's not, this doesn't look like I got lost on my way to work. Like that's a whole different thing, but like just those subtle kind of, you know, mental status kind of things where you're like, wait, why don't I, why didn't I know the answer to that? Um, and there's a lot of fascinating research out there right now, even on, um, the effects of estrogen, you know, as, as it relates to potential, um, dementia and Alzheimer's, um, risk reduction. So there's a, there's a lot of whole body implications that we are even learning about still when it comes to estrogen. Can you do a quick review just because mm -hmm. people watching, I think it would be helpful to understand how do the hormones usually work? Because I, I think the whole idea of the estrogen that climbs and then drops right before your period, like that helps people kind of understand then what's happening during mm -hmm. perimenopause and ultimately during menopause. So it feels a little bit less, oh my God, what the hell is going on here? Right. So we're, we're cycling, obviously, when you get a period, you know, your estrogen and progesterone 
um, are at certain levels, and then you ovulate, and there's this peak, you know, so usually we feel really good around ovulation, all of our hormones are up, our testosterone's up, our estrogen's up, and then sort of, you know, you're in this kind of phase where they're, they're both sort of starting to go down, and this is an overgeneralization, right, there is like some nuance to this too, but for the most part, you know, it's this sort of, you know, nice, even, up and down, that always kind of stays within this nice range, well, when we are perimenopausal, those fluctuations are wild. They are like all over the place. And sometimes there may be months where we don't ovulate. And so your lining of your uterus might build up to be extra thick. And so when we do get our period, it's, you know, heavy for that reason. So it's, it's a very, um, it's complicated because the body is trying to keep up and everybody has a different, you know, playbook for this. Um, some people really, you know, have no issues with periods and some women, you know, have tons and some women don't have hot flashes or mild, you know, mild, you know, hot flashes and some women that's like the worst, you know, symptom they have. So everybody's presentation really, um, when they come to see us, we really dig deep into what's bothering you most. And we try to go after those specific symptoms. Um, and oftentimes in perimenopause, you know, it's, it's sometimes the go-to to give, to put women on oral contraceptives. So somebody just, somebody just put a question. Right I saw, that's why I was going to uh, ask. Oh, right. Okay, good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because, you know, people, that is sort of the easy, the easy thing to do because your hormones are still working. They're just not working as well. So when we put a woman on oral contraceptives, we're basically overriding her system, right? We're, we're saying, you're, you're screwing this up. Like, we're taking it from here. We can do it better than you. <laughs> we can do it better than you. I mean, that's not always, that's not necessarily true, but it does get rid of those symptoms of just kind of crazy periods, erratic periods, hot flashes, all that will go away on the birth control pill. Um, there are other side effects, obviously, of being on the birth control. Like, that's going to probably kill your libido, you know, which was probably already low to begin with. Um, you know, and then Although, when to be you... fair, it, that's not, it doesn't, I, I feel like, I think this is like 60%, somewhere of 60. So you may be lucky to be in that 30 to 40% because there's right. some women who do great and sort of sail through perimenopause mm -hmm. because they're either on IUD or birth control pills. So right. it may be something to look at, you know, Absolutely. but it can. Yeah. And it's a great choice for, you know, if, if your choices are, you know, like, like having ridiculous, crazy, irregular cycles and hot flashes, and you're still in early, like an early stage of perimenopause, that birth control pill is going to make your quality of life better. And if that, that might just be the most important thing to, to weigh out. Um, but an, you know, IUD, and an IUD may help also, because an IUD may also, it well, won't. Just... Yeah, I mean, it's not going to help with the vasomotors. It's not going to suppress right. your ovaries. So some of those symptoms are not going to go away. But it, but it might make your periods lighter. Mm -hmm. it, like, or stop them from being crazy. Like some yes. people just, you know, if they use the Mirena, they just stop getting their period. Yeah, um, and, and yeah. IUD has other really nice benefits too, like endometrial protection, you know, against endometrial cancer. Um, because when that lining of the uterus gets thick, you're more at risk for that. So yeah, I mean, it's a conversation. Again, these are all like very, you know, personal, like pers situational and personal and your doctor should really sit with you and spend the time with you to go over, you know, what is the best plan of care for you. That's the bottom line. It's so funny. My friend Sarah Mizrahi just said, didn't help me, which I know we had conversations about the IUD. Right. I, I, just, I want to add one thing because I just think it's super interesting for women to like hear. So what happens when these hormones are going crazy and correct me if I get something off here about Jackie, because you're definitely the hormone queen here, but um, your, your, the, your body is sending hormonal signals to, to your ovaries to shoot out an egg. And so every month the LH and the FSH climb as they're trying to get that egg out. But if your body is, you know, not giving out eggs anymore because you don't have them, they're not in good shape, they're lazy, whatever reason, mm -hmm. now those hormones have to climb and climb and work harder. And they're like, send out an egg, send out an egg, send out yes. an egg. And it's by looking at those hormones when you do a blood test that your doctor can say, wait a minute, I think you're headed towards um, menopause. Am I getting that right? Jackie, yes, that, that yes. but that's kind of a controversial subject because you're right. Really? I mean, that is how we, we describe it globally. Yeah, because there is no test for perimenopause. So right. you might, you know, that may be true, like as you're really getting closer to your final period, you might look at an FSH and an LH, those are the two hormones you're talking about. And you're right, they are elevated and they almost, they stay elevated for the most part. However, in the early to middle part of perimenopause, when you might still be having all these other symptoms, your FSH and LH are all over the place, up, down, and everywhere. So you, it's really hard to get an accurate lab test to tell us that you are definitively in perimenopause. Um, there's some, you know, 
some controversy and a lot of gynecologists won't test for these things um, unless like the patient really begs for it for that reason. Right. Sometimes we do those tests just because I feel like it makes the patient feel better. Like it just like, they feel like they're not crazy. Like I, I you yep. know, Right? We do, absolutely. We do at Maze because we, we can we can do that and we, we can work with the patient like on an ongoing basis to keep checking levels and kind of see the trends. But a one off test sometimes is misleading. And so a lot of doctors are just not willing to do it. But I, I do always check it if a woman's complaining of those things and she's in the range. I think it's, you know, a nice number to have, like you said, to sort of, if it is high, we can say, okay, this might not be, it's not that you're in menopause tomorrow. It might just be that this is where you were, but here you are, here's your really high FSH. So there's something going on. Sometimes it makes women feel better also to know it's not high. If they're still thinking about having babies. I mean, that's, that's the flip yeah. side of it as well. Now, can you just talk for a minute? Cause I know a lot of women talk about their bodies changing, maybe mm. gaining weight. Getting more yes, fat in the choice, right? So yes. So that the the lack of estrogen just causes a shift of fat deposition to you know to the middle. So you know fat fat women will notice that you know before maybe they put on more weight in their thighs you know and, and their their butt now it's kind of you know that spare tire around the middle is growing too and that is um, really problematic for a lot, you know, a lot of women really are, you know, having trouble getting that off. They do all the, the diets in the world and it's just stubborn and it stays there. So it is, you know, there's some, again, preliminary research to show potentially that hormone replacement therapy can mitigate that, that abdominal fat um, deposition, but these are things that we just don't know yet. Um, so the best advice in terms of abdominal fat and, and low estrogen is, you know, eating a healthy diet, potentially sort of a not keto, but like, you know, a lower, like low sugar, low, like minim minimizing refined processed foods, processed yep, refined yep. you know, like high fiber, fiber is really, really important for estrogen metabolism and the, our good gut bacteria love fiber and they help with, with estrogen metabolism. So that, you know, the, the tie back to obviously exercise, high intensity interval training has been shown to, you know, help with that, with, you know, abdominal fat as well. So, and intermittent fasting potentially as well. Right, and I'll try to take it from a slightly different perspective, which is that there's also something to be said, and please don't hang up on me when I say this, but um, you know, your body's change. Like your body's doing different things for you at different times in your life. And it could be that your body's not gonna look the same at 44 as it looked when you were 24. And, right. and that's kind of okay. Like your brain's not the same either. And your kindness is probably not the same either. And so maybe this is a time, and, and in general, perimenopause is a complicated time. Like yep. for some women, they're just sort of saying, oh my God, I'm starting to get old. Like I'm starting to, I'm not, I'm closer to my parents' age than I was to my kids' age. You know what I mean? That's where, yeah. and that's a shift in identity. And part of that is your body changing. And so mm -hmm. maybe this is time, if possible, to in addition to exercise, eating right, spend some time like learning to love your body the way your body is. I mean, yeah, that's an excellent, that's such a good, a good way to reframe thinking around this because, you know, we're not going to be the same person when we're 20, 30, 40, 70, right? So you will evolve but just to be the best version of yourself that you can be. And I, I like to think about it, okay, well, yeah, maybe there's a little more abdominal fat, but women in this phase of life really should focus more on maintaining and building muscle mass, lean muscle mass, because that is going to help with meta maintain metabolism. It's gonna help with um, maintaining bone density. We lose a lot of our bone density in the early stages of you know menopause. After that last period, our bone density just drops off precipitously. So um, you know, strength training, resistance training needs to be part of, of the, you know, the lifestyle we choose. And, and uh, most of the women who hit perimenopause really, for the most part, don't have very little kids. Some of them do, but most of them really don't have little kids anymore. And so this might be a really nice time for you to say, like, my body is changing. Maybe my life needs to be changing a little bit also. Yeah. And to be focusing a little bit more on myself, you know? Um, very hard. You know, women have spent most of their, you know, prior decades, like, catering to their families and their, you know, potentially their careers and others and others, putting others first. And, yeah, I think just really working with women to say that you have, you know, we outlive our ovaries now by decades. Like we have to take our health into our hands if we want to continue to live, you know, and and live happily and healthily and, and continue to be there for our families in, long, in the long run. You know, I want you to hear what Jackie said again, because I feel like it's so important. We're going to outlive our ovaries. That wasn't always true. You know, for many, many years, women lived till the 40s or 50s, and they, you know, gave birth to children. They had a couple more years, and then they died. Yes. Um, 
Oh, somebody just wrote, oh, God, it's so many little kids. It's fine. It's amazing. Your kids will keep you young. They're amazing. Yes. They keep you, you moving. <laughs> I just was at, at the point when your littlest kid becomes, doesn't need you so much. It is a shift in identity. And that often comes along with perimenopause and menopause. That's all I was trying to say. <laughs> um, and so, yes, you're, and you're, they're going to grow up faster than you know. So just need it to say, Jackie has little yeah. kids. You yes, you do. Yes. 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 Exactly. I, I get to their upstairs, hopefully in bed. <laughs> hopefully, but hopefully. You know, they know you're going live, so they're going to They do. They do. Um, so, um, so let's talk about what we can do to help women. If, if there's okay. anything we can do. And also, what does it get mixed up with? Let's talk about what sometimes happens when women go to doctors and doctors just throw medicine at them. Yeah. I, mean, I think that there are a lot of doctors don't know, you know, don't recognize the symptoms. So it could be any, you know, if you're having bloating, but you know, then you're, you know, they're, you're getting asked to do a colonoscopy or an upper endoscopy, or if you're having headaches potentially, or, you know, anxiety or depression, you know, this, you know, really the, the we're treating just sort of like the low hanging fruit. Like it's that easy thing, treat the symptom and move them on. But the reality is we need to be looking at the root cause. Like why is this person who never had you know, headaches before or anxiety before all of a sudden presenting with that and looking at her age and her other symptoms. And so really digging deeper and saying potentially this is a symptom of perimenopause or menopause and what can we do about that rather than treating, you know, just treating the, the obvious thing and moving on. Because that's not solving the problem, right? So it's really important, I think, for people to hear that. I really think because I, I get it, you know, you're, you're 44, 45, and for the first time you're having headaches and, or you're tired all the time. And so you go to your doctor and the doctor says, well, let me try to give you vitamin B shots, you know, like, or he says, let me give you sleeping pills. Cause all of a sudden you're waking up in the middle of the night, which you never did before. So mm -hmm. rather than sort of try to treat the, each particular symptom, maybe stop and back up and think, okay, wait, what am I seeing as a whole here, right? Like that's, Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And I think that, you know, you, you talked about treatments and I think that that is, again, a very personal sort of like roadmap that we have to lay out for patients. We need to be partners with them, educating them. I think that the most rudimentary level, it starts with like, you know, lifestyle changes. So again, minimizing processed sugars, getting exercise, adequate sleep, you know, getting the phone out of the bedroom at night, minimizing blue light, you know, circadian rhythm. I'm like, I, I, I'm like, oh my God. God. <laughs> I know, I know. All the things that are hard to do, right? Like that, those things have to sort of happen first. Um, and we need to, that's most of the time not going to be enough, especially as we move through into the later phases, but that those good health behaviors will serve you through the entire phase of perimenopause into menopause and beyond, right? They're like the foundations, the pillars of good health. So we, we encourage that first, right? I'm going gonna, like, I'm gonna to interrupt for one second because mm -hmm. for women listening to this who are thinking to themselves, oh my God, there's like no way I can do this. Like I, my phone at night, cutting out white sugar, cutting out processed food. Like, so here's what I'm going to tell you. You're not going to do it all at once. You're not. But you can pick one thing and say like, from what this one thing I'm going to just do for a little while and see how I feel. And then I'm going to add one more thing and see how I feel. And you'd be amazed. You're, a year is going to go by and you're going to turn around and your phone won't be in your bedroom. I'm like still working on that one. Your phone won't be in your bedroom. You'll have cut out some foods that really don't make you feel good and don't nourish you. You'll have added exercise in that you love and movement that you can really embrace. And you're just going to feel better. Yes. And then there can be some medical options as Correct. well, right? Yes. So, okay. That's such a good point. I mean, it can feel really daunting. And when things feel daunting, we just don't do any of it, right? So better to try to do one thing, one simple thing and use a tracker, you know, write it down. Like it's shown people who write down their goals, you know, are more likely to achieve them. So there's that. Um, but moving on from that, I mean, we can then layer, sometimes there's some supplements, you know, if women are like just wanting to start with something easy, like, you know, I often like to, to suggest magnesium glycinate, you know, for women who are having issues um, sleeping at night um, and also potentially some is that different than Is that different than regular magnesium? So magnesium comes in many forms. Like many people might be familiar with mag citrate, which is like what we use for bowel prep, you know, when we're having like a colonoscopy. So that could be more harsh. So the more gentle version of that is magnesium glycinate. Um, and it's been shown that taking about 400 to 500 milligrams about an hour before bedtime can really help calm the nervous system and also help with sleep, but have the dual benefit of regulating bowel function. So if you're having issues with constipation, especially around like before your periods and people get a little constipated, that's a nice thing to help regulate that as well. So, you know, we kind of look at all the symptoms and pick a, you know, kind of pick some easy things that are- You're getting you know, a lot of hearts on that one. People okay, are really good. liking that one. Just saying, <laughs> magnesium, everybody right out. Easy, some easy things. These are things yes. that 
most women are a little deficient in magnesium anyway. Plus, it's a good um, mineral that's important for, for bones. So in addition to vitamin D, which we also really love. Okay, so <laughs> spend a minute talking. I was about to say, what about vitamin D? Okay. Vitamin D, is, yeah, and, and, and magnesium and calcium, those are like three, the three best friends that, you know, anyone could ever have. They're like, you know, this, this, this nice trifecta of, you know, things that basically not only help our, our bones, but help our immunity, help our, our mood. Um, and those are all things we need right now, let's be honest, right? So yeah. taking, what about fish you know, oil? Fish oil is good. Fish oil is, is, has good heart benefits for sure. Um, but, but not D, relevant for this in particular. Oh, and not that I'm, no, there's nothing like specific. There's no specific symptom other than like, if you're menopausal, you're more at risk for, you know, heart disease. So fish oil, if you have a lipid profile, that's maybe not that great or genetic history, a uh, family history of um, high lipids, maybe adding fish oil is, is, is something nice to do. At one point they were talking about fish oil helping with um, brain fog. I don't know if that was ever, I, I have no idea if that was an ever. And I just, I just remember one of my kids was asking me a bunch of years ago why I take fish oil. And I was like, oh, because it was good for whatever, whatever. And then I said, I know there's a third reason, but I can't remember. <laughs> it could help. I mean, if you're not getting fat deposits in the arteries to your brain, it could help with brain fog in theory. Right? So, okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. okay. Sorry. Sorry. No, Sorry as far as hot flashes go, like it has been shown, um, even, you know, anecdotally, but also in some kind of limited research that keeping vitamin D levels above 40, you know, which is more in like the good range, there's a range, but it's very broad. Um, so keeping your vitamin D levels in good range has been shown to, to sort of help minimize hot flashes. So there's, that's a good, you know, a good thing to do. And it's really easy to take vitamin D. It's available readily over the counter. If you forget one day, you can double up the next. It's, it's well tolerated. It's D3. It's D3. Yep. And you can take anywhere from two to 5,000 IUs a day, depending on, on what you want. Right. It's a lot. You don't, you pretty much don't have to worry about overdosing unless you're like drinking the bottle. So you, yeah, if you're doing that, there's bigger problems. <laughs> so yeah. So that's another one I, I often recommend um, just for, for all the reasons we discussed. Yeah. And then sometimes there's, you know, the usual things we hear about when it comes to med, like black cohosh is, is something that helps with hot flashes. Um, there. And what now? So let, now let's go back to like mm -hmm. the classic sort of birth control pills. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So birth control pills are, are you know the next level. You know, like you're like okay, I can't take this. I need like something to help. Taking like a low dose birth control pill um, that's going to regulate your period and and keep things even, Stephen, is going to get the job done um, for sure. And sometimes SSRIs can be helpful also. Low dose SSRIs, like very low dose SSRIs. Right? SSRIs are generally thought of as anti anxiety or antidepressants. Right. Correct. But they can be used in this situation, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, not every woman is a candidate for birth control pills or hormone replacement therapy. So if you are a woman who has a history of blood clots, DVTs, PEs, liver disease, um, any kind of like, you know, breast cancer, you know, personal breast cancer, history of, of you know, uterine cancer, you are probably not going to be given a birth control pill or hormone replacement therapy. So then we look more to managing the symptoms. And you're right, Basheva, that yes, some SSRIs used sort of in low doses off label have been shown. And there are a few FDA approved products that, that do that as well. And some women really do love that. So, and then of course, there's all the vaginal changes that are happening. Oh, the vaginal changes, which is like what we see all day long in, in our practice, right? And it can get really, it can get bad. I mean, vag the, the, what I like to say about <clears throat> vaginal changes is that they're what we call a local symptom, meaning that we see a lot of women that actually maybe some of their perimenopause and menopause wasn't that bad, but now they're through it. And maybe a couple of years later, they're like, all of a sudden, sex really hurts. Um, I, you know, I, I low levels of lubrication. Um, my partner can't penetrate anymore, and they're I like, bleed. Kind of I bleed. Yes, like, yes. Bleed. yeah, all, all those things. So the vagina is is a little bit different. It's it's the changes we see there. Whereas the hot flashes, the night sweats, the you know mood changes, that's gonna all get better at some point, right? When you're over that hump of menopause and your hormones have finally decided that they're gonna eat, even out again. All of those changes go away, but the vaginal changes will persist because you're always now living with a low level of estrogen and the vagina, the vulva, the vestibule, all those areas need estrogen in order to be healthy and a little bit of testosterone too, to be honest. So when our levels are really low for prolonged periods of time, such as like when you're on a birth control pill, for instance, or in menopause, a lot of times we see changes in the vagina, thinning of the tissues, dryness of the tissues, um, you know, it's what we call adhesions where some of the tissues can even get stuck together. You can get dermatologic things. A lot of things can go on down there. So being 
proactive about your vaginal health is super, super important. And what should people do? Right. So, you know, obviously paying attention to things down there, you know, paying attention to your symptoms. How does sex feel? Am I noticing any changes? Um, but talk, having a conversation with your doctor, your gynecologist, local treatment, meaning local, topical, um, whether it's something as simple as hyaluronic acid, which is non-hormonal, or some local estradiol cream, um, you know, placed appropriately, you know, at the vestibule um, or inside the vagina or both. Um, you know, using really good products matters, you know, if there's some products we love and some products we're not so, such big fans of, but doing that, um, you know, a dedicated practice of, of, you know, applying those, those products will restore vaginal health. And that's important because number one, we obviously want to continue to have, you know, great sex life for many decades to come after menopause because we live long, happy, healthy lives after menopause now. But we also want it to be healthy, meaning we don't want to get recurring urinary tract infections. We don't want to get BV. You know, we want to, we don't want scar, you know, the walls of the vagina to, to get thin. And so then we can get something called prolapse where the bladder starts to protrude. And then we have more, you know, it's a whole host Cycle. of other things. Yeah. So being proactive and saying, I don't want that to happen. What can I do now is a great question to bring up. And, and the other thing is that there are now um, lasers. I'm laughing that you didn't say it because Jackie is like <laughs> laser. It's like she's a laser maven, you know, like. That's so, going there next. There, oh, what, what? I was going there next. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. I, I mean, we love our laser. We love our Mona Lisa laser because, um, you know, these, like I was saying, these you have to be diligent with those creams and those, you know, suppositories. And, and it's a lifelong, you know, thing that you're going to kind of be dedicated to doing as long as you want to be having happy, healthy intercourse. So we often find that women sort of start with the creams, you know, and see how they do. And after a while, and that becomes a little bit burdensome, they're kind of like, oh, I can't be compliant with this anymore. My life's too crazy. What else can I do? Or sometimes they're just like, no, those creams aren't for me. What else can I do right out the gate? <laughs> In which case, you know, we have that conversation. So we have this amazing laser. It's called the Mona Lisa laser. Um, and it's a CO2 laser that is pretty painless. Um, it's an in-office procedure for which you're numb. And it works by stimulating the collagen and elastin in your vaginal wall to sort of re regrow and, and rejuvenate. I hate the word rejuvenate, so that's not a good word. But just regenerate some of that tissue to... Um, make it stretchier, bouncier, more lubricated, um, good plumper. Yes. Yeah, regrow some of that good bacteria that's supposed to be there, um, like lactobacilli that can go away if there's like a lack of estrogen in the vagina. So all of that um, restores all the good things that you know that should be there and make us you know feel good. So yeah, the, at least the laser's great. Yeah. So I guess we're wrapping up because we're you know done. So I guess what Jackie is and I am, are saying is the things that you are going through in your 40s and you're like nowhere near menopause and you think you may be crazy you're not crazy these are all things that can ha start happening 10 years before your menopause and you won't know that you're in menopause until a year after your last period so it's it's kind of a weird time and these are all things that come up but you should definitely you know not think you're nuts take the time for yourself and make sure you have a practitioner who really listens and is able to kind of guide you through this period that's right. Yeah. Am I leaving anything out that you feel like is important? No. I mean, I think just, again, educating yourself on, you know, we don't spend a lot of time teaching women what's going to happen to their bodies, you know, as they enter this phase of life. So even if this conversation is nothing more than just sort of an education, an eye opener about, you know, you may experience none of these things, you may experience some of them, but it's important to be on the lookout so that you can um, you know, go to your doctor and say, this is what's happening and what can we do about it and be taken seriously, you know? I don't know if there's a book you want to recommend. I love the book, Estrogen Matters. I mm -hmm. feel like we have so many misconceptions about estrogen yes. and they did such a great job in that book. The book is called Estrogen Matters. Mm -hmm. I do not remember the name of the author. I feel terrible. I will put it Perfect. up in the resources. Do you yes. remember the name? You don't remember. Oh, no, I don't. But I, yeah. I, I wish and I And is there another book? I feel like there's another book at their sex matters for women but i don't know if there's there's um christina northrup wrote a good book on menopause mm -hmm. right women's yeah. and women and then more. so some of these books which are really meant for menopause could be super useful prior to menopause during men right. menopause also 
And we didn't even touch on, you know, hormone replacement therapy for, you know, the menopausal state itself and then beyond. And that speaks to what's in the book. Um, so know, we should do that. It. We mm -hmm. should do that in the future. I mean, I'm laughing. I think we have to do the menopause one on Facebook because I feel like everybody watching this is way too young. They're like in their 30s and 40s. Nobody on Instagram. Is <laughs> so yeah, hopefully that's changing. But yeah, I see your point. And I mean, there's, you know, we didn't talk about the Women's Health Initiative study and how that was misinterpreted. So that's a whole conversation. Again, women, you know, need to understand the risks and benefits of est estrogen and there are many many more benefits than you know than risks in a lot of the cases so helen helen one of the therapists just said we should do our uh, we should talk about our bodies ourselves menopause which is, is actually excellent forgot about that um, one. Yeah. hi helen we're so happy you're here yeah um, so um thank you jackie i think honestly maybe we should come back and do a whole thing on estrogen because i feel like that is so so critical to yep. all the women who are watching this and all the men who are watching to the people that they love. <laughs> That's right. That's 100% true. You're right. Because those men are confused anyway, but menopause is really confusing for them. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks a lot, Jackie. You're welcome. Thanks I for really appreciate me. this. Have a good night. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.